So it's your girl Butterfly reporting at the Jamaican Canadian Association here in the Jane and Finch, just outside of the Jane and Finch community, uh, for the second mayoral debate. Um, we had uh, a couple of the candidates come in kind of when they wanted to. Uh, Ford came in late and Smitherman left early. Uh, very similar to the York Woods uh, mayoral debate. Um, things were a little testy. Uh, you know, some actions happened uh, with some of the community members. We're all wrapping up. Check out the interviews. Uh, we talked to some of the audience members as well as some of the key organizers for today's uh, debate. For JaneFinch.com, it's Butterfly. Peace. So recently, in the, not just in the Jaden Finch community, but communities similar to Jaden Finch, there has been uh, police brutality. Three young people have died within the past six months, uh, and communi community believe that it is at the hands of the police. If you are elected for mayor, what would be your role in cleaning up uh, the investigate police? Investigate it. Again, I, I, we have to investigate any complaint that I get. I'll take it to the chief and, I, and I'll find out. I'll, I'll investigate find out what the, what the problem was or what the cause was. I'll, I'll definitely get to the bottom of it, like I've done all the time. Anyone calls me about anything, I always, you know. This is a legacy of decades of police brutality, and I'm sure it's happening in Rexdale, and I'm sure you're hearing about it from the community. What has been your role as a current councillor? or? Even? I've always gone to, like, Ron Tavener is a superintendent at 23rd Division. So if it, it's in 23rd Division, I go right to the top. I talk to Ron. We have dialogue, and if we have to set up a meeting, I've set up numerous meetings with people that have asked me to set up meetings for them. So I, I, I do whatever I can do. I, I take it to the top people and ask them to give me an answer. Is there an urgency to this for you to find out? The There's an urgency. When something happens, it's someone's life. That's serious. That's very serious. And I take it very seriously. Over the past six months, Joe, there's been a death of three young people by the hands of the police. At least the community believes so. What would be your role as the mayor to be uh, to advocate for these families and communities? Well, as mayor, I will sit on the police services board to begin with, where we get the detailed information in camera as well as in public, because as you can appreciate, it could become legal issues, and that's what the law says. To make sure, indeed, that uh, that uh, policing. Um, policies are one which uh, avoid uh, injuring anybody, let alone killing anybody. And I'm not suggesting that's what happened here. I don't know the facts. I can't comment. But it's extremely disturbing when young people, especially racialized young people, fall victim in this society. We know that they are uh, not as, uh, not as uh, endowed with opportunities, economic, uh, and the last thing we need to do is them to feel threatened. And the reality is that people who feel threatened, then are threatened, in effect. And therefore, we got to work even harder to remove that sense of feeling and ensure that it doesn't happen. Uh, over the past six months, three young men have been died by police brutality. What would be your role as uh, mayor if you uh, win the next up coming election? All right. One of the problems in Toronto is that the mayor does not have the power to fire the police chief. I have, at the Lawrence Heights debate, called for the power to, to fire the police chief. Why? In, 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 emergency, in extreme situations where this demonstrable incompetence is on display, the G20... Uh, 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 later, resource office. Uh, exactly. Uh, right. Go through the list. What and and here's role? the thing, and here's the thing. If you come to me to ask how I would address police behavior vis-a-vis -vis my own residents and not give me the power to be able to affect how they behave, then I'm already handicapped to begin with, right? So I've already called for the power to be able to relieve the police chief of duty so that I hold them to account. And obviously, coming from this background, believe me, the last thing I want are people breaking down doors and mass arrests so that people, people are, are let go just two days after because there was no grounds for their arrest. So these families are dealing with a lot of pressure and grief during these times. Um, there's little money for these families to pursue justice. Right. What would your role be in, so in terms of well, supporting look, these they families? Have, they have a wrongful, as I, based on the facts you just gave me, it sounds like they have a wrongful death claim and some, and some lawsuit against the police. Um, it, you know, it's part of the bigger problem. We need people from our communities going into the professions, giving back when they can, um, taking on cases on contingency. A case like this should be in the courts. Well, my understanding is Faulkner has them all down. Um, Julian. Julian Faulkner has them all down, but uh, has told them to stay silent to media as well as community mobilization yeah, and organizing. People are doing something, aren't they? What, what else is Whatever there? arts, theater, whatever they want to do. Like, I, I can only deal with one thing at a time, so I, I deal with the football. That's my area of expertise. But you know what? You bring up good points, call me. If you have ideas, call me. I don't need just one picture. No problem.
My name is Henry Gomez. I'm the chairperson of the Caribana Arts Group, which is the, the new Caribbean Cultural Committee, or CCC. That's the group that created and owns the Caribana Festival and trademark. So today you felt the need to come here and speak uh, to these up and up coming candidates. What, was, what were you thinking to get out of today? I wanted the candidates to give as truthful or as sincere an answer as possible as is possible for politicians regarding the Caribana question because right now for all practical purposes the city of Toronto not owns but controls Caribana. That's the group that comes up with uh, much of the funding but not only that through Councillor Mehevic in 2006 the city appointed a group to manage Caribana. That was to have lasted one year but that group it's now five years, almost five years later, that group is still there and is behaving as if it owns the Caribana Festival and wants to call the shots. If we allow that, it means that Caribana will have been, I would say, I say by uh, sleight of hand, stolen from the Caribbean community. It doesn't matter that there are people of Caribbean background who supposedly are at the FMC table. Those people have no clout, they have no power, no control. We want it to be unambiguous. CAG owns the festival, owns the trademark, and we have to be dealt with as such. So I've seen uh, the changes over the year from being a very community-based uh, festival to a very corporate, uh, you see uh, Scotiabank, Scotiabank all over this. When will the community um, own this again? Well. Let's not mix things up. The perception is that the community doesn't own it anymore. We contend that the community still owns it, but it doesn't control it. And when will we get control? Right. And I can't give you a specific date for that, but that's what we are striving to uh, fix right now. There's a, a political aspect to it because the city has a major say in the sense that it comes up with the initial grant monies for the festival and that gives it a tremendous amount of control and we are saying that this group that is there now, the FMC, we ought to determine whether those people remain or whether we appoint new people. We don't want to run the festival, the directors are not running the festival, but as the owners we should have a major say in who manages the festival on our behalf. I am, I am just so impressed with the turnout, with the kind of questions that were being raised, but more particularly because I think that people really held these candidates accountable. It's the first time that our I've seen our community so fired up, so concerned about what this outcome might be, that they took, and I'm particularly impressed with Jamal Clark and the way he expressed himself, I think he's certainly a very good candidate prospect in this area. I think he needs to get all the support that is possible from within this riding, within this ward. But Carabana, I like the way Mr. Gomez dealt with that question because these candidates have been avoiding it and we have to hold them accountable. Carabana does not belong to the city. It belongs to us. Thank you much. Philip Masco. Yeah. And uh, Philip, you were the moderator tonight? The moderator, yeah. And what did you think about the community's participation at tonight's debate? I think the community asked some good questions. I think the com community has to, let us say, they have to tailor their questions a little bit more because we tend to wobble all over the place. They need to get to the point very, very quickly because it's a debate and, you know, we can't wait while you extemporize and give statements. But all in all, there were very good questions tonight. Like I said, some of them could have been trimmed a little bit, but, you know, I thought we did very well, as we do, because it is an intelligent community. So when it comes to you on voting day on the 25th, did uh, today's debate help you uh, decide who you're going to be checking off? Yes, to a certain degree, and, and, and it, 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 it goes along with what I read on the websites I have seen, right? I mean, my brother here, Kim. So it's important to be we, we informed. You need to hear them. You can see them on a website or read something, but you need to hear the voice. Right? So what you were reading on the website, did it challenge you once you met them in person today? Did it sway you at all? No, I've been around politicians a long time. All right. All right, so what's your names and uh, what brings you here tonight? 
My name is Liam. What brought me here today was um, Rob Ford, actually, because he has a lot of things in Rexdale doing for the youth. And not a lot of the leaders have things doing for the youth, and he's actually willing to step out there and help the youth. And your name? Um, my name's Crystal, and um, I'm also here because like he like basically um, he like works by our school because I go to Thistle Town with Leah, and like he's like done a lot for Rexdale and a lot for us as youth also. So um, and like we're actually helping him too with the with like his whole thing. We're volunteering for him. So you know, it's just it's just nice to know that someone actually cares about us and Rexdale itself because Rexdale doesn't get a lot of recognition for like you know because it's always like oh yeah it's a ghetto and everything so like it's just nice to know that someone's actually there for us. Well my name is Sharon Joseph you guys by now <laughs> know this name. I'm running for city councillor for Ward 7 and tonight we are at JCA at the mayor's um, debate and um, it was wonderful to see you know the mayor's debate but my concern was what about the councillors, the city councillors. I think we do all the footwork and again you know we will just um, pass by straight. So. Um, I want to encourage people anyways, uh, if you're looking or listening, um, on October 25th, we have a few black people running who does the work in Ward 7, 8 or 9. Please remember us. My name is Sharon Joseph and I'm running for Ward 7. We have to get rid of Giorgio Mamaliti once and for all. Come out and vote. All right. Thank you. So that, that's a serious and naming unplug. Well done. <laughs> so, okay, tonight we had a debate here at JCA. It was a packed house. Mm -hmm. So did you find it useful? Um, did you find it useful? Let's start with that. I find it useful for people to come out and, and you know, network and everything. But um, again, I've been hearing the same thing over and over. Solutions, no solutions, the same thing. You're going to cut money, where are you going to put it? And the word priority neighborhood is really getting to me now. I heard it so much times for the night. I think if I get it, when I get into office, I would like to rally for that to be removed. So because there's be a at the potential. There is a <laughs> stigma <laughs> for this priority neighborhood, right? And I was looking for one of the mayors to be, potential mayors, to talk about maybe a trade school in the area. We do need it. Not everybody wants to be lawyers, doctors, or politicians. But we have young people getting into trouble for the first time and they are dislocated. Where, you know, we need places for these young people and I've been fighting that for so many years. I want to continue to fight for, you know, the young people to have a place that they will enjoy and because the curriculum is not geared for everybody, you know, so I want to, you know, do things to assimilate our young people, get them, you know, being interested again in school because, you know, the curriculum as it is right now, there's no interest for some young people to, you know, be in school and just sit there. So if they want to take advantage of trades or something hands-on, you know, that's good too. It pays a lot in construction and why not? So we have to encourage them to do something. And I think if they get in trouble for the first time, the courts, you know, should say, well, this is a place, we have this place. But right now we don't have the place. So community work, community hours, you know, no. Some of the kids, they don't even want to do the community hours. But I think if they do things that they like and appreciate, they will stay in the program. So I'm encouraging something like that. So, at school. Okay. so yeah. tonight's uh, debate, did it was it helpful for you, for yourself as a voter on October 25th, who you'll be checking off for the next mayor of the City of Toronto? I am still undecided. There's so much um, holes, you know, in, in the paper right now. But um, I know when I am elected, I have to work with one of the mayors. So I'm still sleeping on everything I've heard for, you know, the few months and putting the puzzle together. It's a big puzzle. Well, I'm Steve Abara, and um, I saw where the debate was okay. It was really nice. Um, but, you know, politicians always say what they want to say, and they do what they want to do at the end of the day, right? So, but um, just as what we are saying right now, the CTV wanted to was interviewing other candidates, and uh, some people are protesting over there that they didn't interview the black uh, mayor candidate. But I don't know why that should be. But um, I think what is more important is just um, for the these candidates to take into consideration minority uh, uh, issues like um, jobs. Um, housing, you know, settlement, and 
One, la one thing they didn't even talk about here also, like the senior citizens, some of them are suffering in this country. Sometimes people don't care about them, people don't even care what's going on. And uh, they just put them somewhere where they just stay there, people don't even care. Even their children don't even go to you know, look at them. They should find a way to you know, uh, restructure that um, area. You know. So out of tonight's debate, has it helped you as a voter? Are you, will you be voting on October 25th or you don't even know? <laughs> well, um, I would like to vote, okay? But um, I'm still, I'm, I just want to still convince myself the, the right person to vote for, yeah. you know, because uh, in the past we have voted a lot of people, but they ended up doing nothing for us, you know what I mean? And did the conversation or the debate today, did it help you at all? Well, it's part of the educational, uh, you know, we need to be enlightened, we need more knowledge, we need to know what's going on. And um, I think Ford, Ford could make a good candidate. And also, um, what's his name? Uh, Mayor Rocco could make a good candidate. But the only thing now is that I want to, first of all, go to you know understand all their platforms, like their policies and some of the things they want to do. You know what I mean? Yeah. All right, so I'm with Antonius Clark, who's going to be running for uh, city councilor for Ward 8 on October 25th. How are you tonight? I'm fantastic. What did you think about the debate here at uh, JCA? I think it's rhetoric, policies, ideologies, promises. But like everyone in the ward knows, politicians make promises, and then when they get in the seat, they get comfortable, they do nothing. So, you know, that's why I decided I'm going to run, and I'm going to go there to not only hold them accountable, but also deliver some of the work that we need done. It was another debate. So out of everything they talked about today, on October 25th, do you know what box you're checking for the next mayor of the city of Toronto? No, <laughs> but I know that I'm definitely checking Antonius Clark for city councillor of Ward 8. Is there anything you'd like to share with our viewers about tonight's debate? I would have wished to see some more topics spoken about that are more dear to the community. You know, a lot of it was uh, generic or things that never really pertain to the community. But at the end of the day, I guess, you know, it's all stepping stones. And as a counselor, it's my job to take the real issue downtown. Vote Clark for counselor. I'm very appalled that the city, the news, the media won't pay attention to local candidates, but only have you guys parading around. I listen to your ideas when you don't have all the Mr. Answers. Clark, the question, please. I'd also like to thank Alvin Curling and Mario Sergio for being here tonight. And I'd like to then go on to say that in the last three months, Junior Madden was beaten to death by police. The accusation said that he had a heart attack. In the last two weeks, Eric Asawi was shot to death by police. And we keep talking about criminalization of the youth. But it's beyond that now. Youth are being killed by police. And I'm asking, for the last six years, I've worked in an organization called Friends in Trouble, trying to stop the violence in the community and working with youth who are marginalized, like you, Mr. Ford. But let's be real. Prioritizing neighborhoods don't change crime. And hiring them in your factory, you don't have enough positions to hire all of them. When people come out of jail, there needs to be some sort of re-engagement process. And it's not going to happen through programming. Going door to door, I found that my biggest pitch is building Thank a you, trade, Mr. Clark. I'm not you're, you're, you're not asking a Building a trade a school in the community <laughs> is an imperative key to helping young people get back on the tracks of life. Mike Harris introduced a zero tolerance policy which allowed a lot of people to go to the wayside and criminalize them. I don't want now they are young adults coming out of jail. How are we going to engage them? Is building a trade school to get them back the skills to be re-employed something that you're going to do? I don't know who I'm going to vote for. It's a person who supports me. Thank you very much. I think the model that I've seen work, I go back to Regent Park, which is a community that's taught me more in life than just about any other community, was in the redevelopment. 40 youth from the community were hired as apprentices in the Carpenters Union, Local 27, and this model has got to be uh, brought to bear whenever the city's involved in major infrastructure. We're going to spend a lot of money building a lot of transit in our city in the next 10 years. We're going to have to make sure that there are agreements with organized labor to hire youth and provide those opportunities and training centers for the unions 
uh, our, like the Hammerheads program, which offers opportunities at the various training centers of the building trades unions. This is the best model that I've seen because these are real jobs. They're good jobs. They're the kind of jobs that can sustain families. So I'm all for what you're talking about, and I'll be happy to work with you when you're elected and when I'm elected. Thanks. <laughs> I think, Antonio, you, you, you've you put the focus on an issue that is not going to go away with this election. It's certainly not going to go away with the next election. And it will not go away with the election thereafter. I'll tell you why. Because we are criminalizing so many youth from, let me, and for the purposes of my answer, let me use priority neighborhoods. And those guys coming out of, say, jail have a criminal record so they can't get a job. So they go to a temp agency to go get a job that's probably paying them four to five bucks an hour. We continue to feed the cycle. We are the ones responsible. So I think, yeah, there, it is a, it is a, a stain uh, on us as a collective. I think there's some, something needs to be done. Um, what it is, I will have to engage the best of you. And I've known you for some time. And I remember working with you at York. Um, so I will have to engage the best of you. And I, I don't have all the answers, but one thing is, stop criminalizing the young, and even when they do criminalize, the give them second time. chances. Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, Mr. Clark, I wish you the best and, and good luck in your election, and I think you're doing a phenomenal job. But we have to help these people, and, I, and I'm gonna emphasize, we're all human, we've all made mistakes. So when they come out of jail, you can't dismiss them. You have to say, here, whatever we can do to try to help you out, you have a criminal record, okay, so we made a mistake. So we still have to help them to get them into the right jobs. You gotta find out what they wanna do. Everybody has a talent. But how many people actually sit down and work with these people when before they get out of jail, you have to line it up and say, here, there's so many people that give me resumes and I'm more than happy to try to help people out. Obviously, I can't take care of every single person that gets out of jail, but what I can do is get, find out what their interests are and then set up programs using getting sitting down with the federal and provincial government to find out what programs are available for them to, to get into the field that they want. Instead of just throwing them away and saying, here's a factory job, when they don't want a factory job. They have a talent, may it be a whatever, but there are programs in the provincial and federal government. Well, in terms of what the city can do, you gotta remember 8% of all taxes paid in Toronto go to the city. 92% to the provincial or federal government. The city cannot do the job the federal government, provincial must do, and they must do more in terms of youth employment, retraining, and so forth. However, the city has got to do certain things, but it should not be doing what Mr. Spinner suggests, build a jail and send a bill to Queen's Park, like he says on the website. That's criminalizing people even more, frankly. We should not be doing what Mr. Spinner and Mr. Ford suggest, which means we cut the amount of money the city has to spend, either by $365 million, like he says, or $1.7 billion, and it make you think that we have more money to spend on youth or anybody else. I think we gotta do more training programs, you know, for young people, make sure they work in our capital projects, be it water, sewage, or, or transit, and that's the kind of things the city's gotta do. The city's gotta do its job. The mayor of Toronto has to do things directly and has to advocate for the youth and people of Toronto. That's what Joe Pantaloni will do. Thank you.